when driving through the city, you see tents lined up one by one, panhandlers going up and down the streets begging for change, and needles seemingly everywhere. What is it that you're thinking? The immediate thought that comes to mind, it's engendered in the stigma that surrounds addiction. And with that, we are asking the wrong question. And that question is, why don't they just stop putting the needle in their arm? But it's not about the needle. The questions we need to be asking are, how did the needle end up there? Why did the needle end up there? And what it is that we can do to help? In today's society, there's a very misunderstood problem that many still turn a cheek to what is right there in front of them. It's hard to imagine someone coming out of these walls of addiction, standing taller than ever, proud to be who they are, proud to be what they have gone through, and seeking a life full of service. But rebirths, they do occur. Definitions of rebirth include the act of reappearing, flourishing after a decline, to be born again. On July 24th of 2017, a rebirth occurred. It was on this date that I was born again. I had finally reappeared after a decades-long decline where drugs and alcohol controlled my every move. They not only controlled my every move, they robbed me of all my dreams, and they stripped me of all my morals, leaving me just merely existing. On this date is what started a 20-month journey, and that has culminated to me standing here today before you as evidence that it does not matter how far down you may have fallen. It does not matter how lost, depressed you may be. I was there. I was lost. I was all alone. I had no sense of being, and I had no human connection. But there is hope. There's always someone there that has their hand up waiting for you to help. And with that, then we can go on and move forward. And in doing so, we can realize that it's okay. Things can get better. And when walking, <laughs> sorry, when driving through that city and you end up at that stoplight, and you see a man walking towards you, begging for change. Remember that that man is a human being like you and me. There's somebody's son, there's somebody's father, and there's somebody's friend. And that friend is me. You see, a little over a month ago, I was in that exact situation, sitting at a city light, and I see a man going car to car in front of me, I soon realized I knew that individual. He was someone who was somewhat of a mentor to me during those crucial early stages of recovery. I went through detox with him, and he helped guide me and let me know, preparing me for what was ahead. And as he got closer, I rolled my window down, yelling his name, and before I knew it, he nearly jumped through the window hugging me, warm embrace, feeling the tears come down. All he could say to me was, Jason, please help me. I don't want to be living like this anymore. Stunned by the events that just unfolded and in a panic because the light was turning green, I just handed him my card and, and said, please call me. I'll do whatever I can. So the next morning, I went looking for him. I went to that same spot, and there he was, going car to car. This time, he was holding a happy Valentine's Day sign. As he approached, I asked him to please get in, and we pulled over at a gas station up the way. Immediately, he broke down as he began to tell me how he ended up where he did, telling me that he had lost everything. He no longer had any contact with his teenage children, told me nightmarish stories about living on the streets 
and also in the shelters. And he also told me that he was proud of me. He had heard how, what I was doing, and he asked if I would be his recovery coach once he could find himself off the streets. So how is it that he ended up amidst the tents and the needles, and I ended up here as a best-selling author, a national recovery advocate, and now a TED Talk speaker? Everyone experiences trauma in their lives, but it is through these hardships where we can begin to build our resilience. We're picking up the pieces of our past and laying down a solid new foundation. It wasn't only until I <laughs> took what is typically a weakness and used it as my greatest strength. I ripped off the mask that was hiding this broke, scared boy, and I allowed myself to be vulnerable for the very first time. I had finally admitted that I no longer had the answers. I had finally admitted that I could not do this on my own. And then I followed by uttering the three most difficult words any addict can ever say. The very three words that my friend had said to me, please help me. And it was with that that I went on my journey, knowing wholeheartedly what it feels like to be lost, alone, depressed, hopeless, and full of despair. I recognized the importance that human connection was going to play and help motivate me to even want to get better. I began to deconstruct my past traumas, knowing that in order for me to ever live the life that I wanted, I would have to face them head on once and for all. And understanding that I'll never experience the pain that I had already endured, I can now use these traumas and learn from them and take accountability for the pain that I may have caused those that I love. And it is our resilience that is going to allow us to overcome these adversities and become stronger than ever. I soon realized that I was beginning to become part of something far bigger than my journey. Through the success of my book, Stop Thinking Like That, No Matter What, a new world full of opportunities had entered my life. Platforms such as this, allowing me to share my mission, share my message, and employ what my mission is of spreading hope and inspiration to as many people as humanly possible. And that includes running next month's Boston Marathon, whatever it takes. And with running the marathon and doing what I have done, I wanted to be able to give back as much as I could. So I then took classes to earn my recovery coach certification. And recently, just completed an extensive course to become a certified peer specialist. And joining this groundbreaking peer movement, I am now able to answer those questions that we should have been asking all along. How did the needle end up there? Why is it there? And what is it that I can do to help? The peer movement is a radical new approach for mental health and recovery advocacy. And with that, it allows those struggling the opportunity to have support networks from those with lived experience, showing them that they are no longer alone. Peers are on the first line of defense. They're creating safe environments and connections by being empathetic and understanding of the situation. These connections, they're created by getting to know the individual, by actively engaging with them, and becoming more and genuinely interested than interesting. It is through these efforts that we can show our compassion, and we can now encourage resiliency, and we can encourage vulnerability. The primary factor and constructing resiliency is through caring and supportive relationships. 
And as a recovery coach and a peer specialist with that lived experience, that is exactly what I am built to do. The peer movement is on, and it is here to stay. Those fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, who were once lawyers and doctors, police officers and teachers, who now find themselves struggling with substances, they are in need of human connection too. And with that human connection, they can begin to get better. With that connection, they can begin to heal. I am no one special. I'm no better than the millions who are out there still struggling with substances or in recovery themselves. I am just very, very blessed to have found my purpose. And my purpose becomes clearer by the day. As countless individuals are getting better. They're getting better from the hope that I am constantly putting out there. And they're realizing that as Gandhi would say, they too can be the change that they wish to see in the world. Thank you very much.